Chapter 11 in the book Super Energy Fields of Consciousness There is another form of matter apart from the atom which could impact our understanding of life and its origins. Only 0.1% of the universe consists of atoms. 99.9% .9 of matter is non-atomic. Most quantum vortex particles of matter are not atoms. They occur in a form of matter called plasma. About 98% of the mass of our solar system is plasma in the Sun. Combined, the planets orbiting the Sun that are made up of atomic matter add up to 2% of the mass of the solar system. In an atom, electron vortices orbit a central nucleus of proton and neutral neutron vortices of energy and the vortex energy extending between the electrons and protons sets up a force of electric charge attraction that holds the electrons in orbit. So there's a picture of the atom consisting of electron vortices orbiting a central nucleus containing proton and neutron vortices. And I'll explain what these electrons and protons are in, in the third book, The Quantum Vortex. In most atoms, the oppositely charged particles are paired off so that the atom is electrically neutral. If life depends on electricity, atomic matter would be the worst stuff in the universe for supporting life. However, if electrons are added to an atom or taken away from it, then the atom becomes an electrically active ion. In atomic matter, ions can support life because they conduct electricity. In plasma, electrons don't orbit atomic nuclei. As electrons and protons are not paired in plasma, it is electrically active and therefore it is ideal for generating conditions favourable for life. The universe is mostly plasma, which is capable of conducting electricity. So if electricity is essential for life, the universe could be alive. It could be a living organism. It could be a reasoning, sentient being like you and I. Most plasma in the universe exists in stars. Stars are nuclear furnaces where temperatures are too high for atoms to form. Electrons are racing too fast in stars to orbit protons and, and atomic nuclei. Instead, electrons, protons, neutrons and atomic nuclei all move about at high speeds in total chaos. But stars continually lose plasma into space. The sun is a star, and as well as ra radiating heat and light, it continually emits high-energy electrons, protons, neutrons, and atomic nuclei. These cosmic ray particles pour out of the sun into space as solar wind. The sun also loses plasma into space as coronal mass ejections, known as solar flares. This is true for all stars. All stars blow off plasma into space. The consequence of this is that space accumulates plasma like the seas accumulate salt. And there is a direct corollary here. The salty water in our bodies is called plasma. In stars, plasma is hot, but in space, plasma is cold. The cold plasma in space may not be chaotic, so it might lend itself to organisation into electric field formations, which could set up conditions favourable for life. Let me explain. If the nucleus of an atom were the size of a golf ball, the nearest orbiting electron would be about two miles away. Moving freely in space, electrons, protons, nuclei and atomic nuclei, would be much further apart. Though the distances between charged vortex particles in space may be vast, because their electric and magnetic fields extend into infinity, they could form electric and magnetic fields. 
And these fields could be organized and they could transmit information throughout the universe. If space contains charged quantum vortex particles, it could be full of fields of electric activity. If electric activity is the basis of life, then these fields could be alive to the extent that they could conduct electricity and transmit information. These fields of plasma could transmit conscious information and provide a physical base for conscious awareness. If that were so, electric and magnetic fields of plasma in space could set up electric fields of consciousness throughout the universe. These ideas are speculative, but they could make sense of spiritual beliefs and give us a better understanding of spirits, angels and gods. So you see what I'm doing in this book? I'm building up a picture. First of all, by taking down, by demolishing some of the existing ideas in religion and science, you know, the ideas the creationists have of a monotheistic God making everything perfect at the beginning, the ideas of the evolutionists who argue that the universe just evolves, life in the universe just evolves through pure blind chance, and just building up from the idea that particles of energy are more like thoughts than things, building up the idea that conscious intelligence, conscious awareness is built in into the fabric, the quantum fabric of the universe, we can begin to build a new idea around the ancient idea of God without the religious overtones. We can do it from the basis of quantum physics, but a quantum physics that embraces the quantum vortex as well as the quantum wave. So this is the journey we're on, this is where we're going. And now we're beginning to understand that space is full of this cold plasma, which sets up, could set up electric fields over, over vast distances that could transmit information, carry information. And it's these fields of intelligent, conscious life in space that I call the fields of consciousness. The basis of spiritual belief is that there are invisible, low-density beings in space called spirits. It could be that spiritual life is a perception people had of fields of consciousness. If plasmic fields of consciousness do exist in space, they would be invisible because cold plasma does not reflect light. Hot plasma in the stars and the sun emits light, which is reflected by atomic matter. This enables us to see it. Non-atomic plasma is only visible if it emits light. Some forms of cold plasma emit light and are luminous. Most forms of cold plasma remain invisible, as they do not emit light. The definition of spirits is that they occur in space. They are conscious and alive and they are low density and invisible. Fields of consciousness fits this definition precisely. There are many forms the plasmic fields of consciousness could take. Detected through its electromagnetic properties, plasma has been observed to form vortices or helices and vast filament networks connecting the stars. Cold plasma occurs in spheres called orbs. These have been detected by electric apparatus. Orbs can be suspended. Sometimes they move about, invisible to the naked eye. They're often caught as images on electrically operated digital cameras. People say they are prevalent in places where the presence of spirits is felt. These orbs could be cold plasma fields of consciousness formations. They could be spirits. The fields of consciousness could form non-biological, non-atomic life forms in outer space and in spaces in our world. Space could be full of non-biological life. Some scientists believe this to be so. The author Mark Healy reported the observations of a Russian scientist that could impact on our understanding of life. V. N. Tistovic 
a scientist at the Russian Academy of Sciences, has shown how plasma can self-organize when exposed to electric charge. Tistiovic has developed his observations into a theory of inorganic life. The principal location of this is in the helical dust structures that have been seen to form around stars and in interstellar space. In a gravity-free environment, these plasma particles bead together to form string-like filaments, which then twist into helix-shaped strands closely resembling DNA. These structures are electrically charged and are attracted to each other. They are able to feed by assimilating other less organized plasmas through their boundary walls. They can reproduce by amoeba-like splitting. And each of the plasma's offspring retains the capacity for self-organizing growth and further reproduction. According to Tistiovic, they are autonomous, they can reproduce, and they evolve. They, this behavior fulfills enough criteria, in his opinion, to be considered a form of life. End of quote. If there are forms of plasma that are alive, these would be lighter, less solid, and more fluid than the atomic bodies we inhabit. Because in atomic bodies, electric fields lock atoms together to form solids, liquids, and gases. None of these atomic constraints would apply to plasmic life forms, the simplest of which would be a sphere. Living forms of plasma could sense each other and their spatial environment by feeling the forces of electricity and magnetism that lie between them. This is how they could be conscious and aware. If spiritual matter is plasma and plasmic matter is atomic, if spiritual matter is plasma and physical matter is atomic, then the difference between physical and spiritual life could be the difference between atomic matter and plasmic matter. The plasmic theory for spiritual reality could pave the way for research in physics into spiritual phenomena. We could begin scientific lines of inquiry into the links between natural and supernatural life by thinking of life in terms of electrical activity and spirits as electric and magnetic fields of consciousness. In religion, both God and the angels are defined as spirits, so there could be a confusion between God and the angels. This confusion is clear in the Bible, in the communication between God and Abraham, when he was called to sacrifice his son. The angel that appeared to stay Abraham's hand spoke as God, then the angel of God called again to Abraham from heaven, I the Lord. So the quote from the Bible is, Then the angel of God called, Ab called again to Abraham from heaven, I the Lord. Genesis 22:15. I put that verse in there to show that in the Bible, the angel speaks as God, which is crucial to my understanding of monotheism. I, serious belief that the God of the Bible, the God worshipped by Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is in fact one of the Elohim, may have been the leader of the Elohim, who broke away for his own agenda and established a chosen people to fulfill that agenda. And I'm one of them. My father was Jewish. I still keep the Shabbat on Saturdays. And that verse from Genesis 22, 15 is very, very re revealing about the angelic nature of the Jewish God. So far I've only spoken of plasma in terms of energy, but just as atomic matter can exist in the form of physical energy and super energy, the same could be said of plasma. As well as physical energy plasma, the universe may be full of super energy plasma. If the universe were connected by electric fields of consciousness, treated as living entities, growing and evolving, and transmitting and receiving information, 
the collective of these components of intelligence could be thought of as God. The contributions of this collective of intelligence to the evolution of life on earth could be construed as creation by God. On a universal scale, God could be thought of as a universal brain or computer functioning as the whole made up of we and the plasmic spirits as the parts. If we are fractals or holograms of this universal pattern, it could be said that we are made in the image and likeness of God. This description of us as a group consciousness involved in the creation of the universe is a very empowering idea. If we are in incarnations of the plasmic fields of consciousness that are responsible for creation, then in our essential being, collectively, we could be the living, conscious, electric fields of consciousness and electric fields of conscious intent underlying everything in our world, animate and inanimate. If we believe that story, we would have reason to drop victim mentality and take personal responsibility for everything that happens to us and everyone else. I want to repeat that last paragraph because I think it's so relevant to the human condition and understanding our present situation on this planet. This description of us as a group consciousness involved in the creation of the universe is a very empowering idea. If we are incarnations of the plasmic fields of consciousness that are responsible for creation, then, in our essential being, collectively, we could be the living, conscious, electric fields of consciousness underlying everything in our world, animate and inanimate. If we believe that story, we would have reason to drop victim mentality and take personal responsibility for everything and everything that happens to us and everyone else. So thank you for your attention. That ends chapter 11 and in my next podcast I will be reading chapter 12 all about the relationship between water and life so that we get an idea of why we have, why we're all here on a watery planet, the, the vital importance of water in this whole picture that I'm beginning to paint. So what I'm trying to do, if you can see the way it's going, is, is to find um, sort of gr common ground between evolution and creationism. You know, appreciating that the beings we worship as gods are very much part of the universe. You know, Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, when he wrote The Intelligent Universe, said he preferred the idea of the gods, the Roman idea, as sort of managers in the universe than the Christian idea of a single God creating universe. In other words, he liked the idea that the, the gods are, 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 are managers in an already existing universe. So I leave you with that note. Thank you for listening.